Good evening and welcome. Tonight we'll be going over the very brief history and geography of the Central African Republic. What you really need to know about the Central African Republic is that it is very sparsely populated in parts of it and it's not a very developed country in terms of the rest of the countries of the world. So typically after going over geography and history, I would show you some pictures either in book form, but couldn't find any books about this country in my library system. And I would then show you pictures on my tablet. And <laughs> the only real pictures of this country are a couple buildings in the capital city, Bangui and some elephants and pictures of tourists taking selfies in front of trees. So there's not really much to show you in terms of photos. So tonight we're just going to do some geography and some history. So as you could probably surmise, the Central African Republic is in Central Africa. It's a really interesting name in that it perfectly describes the country. It's a republic in Central Africa. I really like its French name because it's, of course, the Republic du Centre African, African Centre, something like that. But it's shortened to Centrafique, which I think is really cool. And I don't see why more people don't adopt that name because it sounds really awesome, even if you don't know French. But whatever. In English, it is Central African Republic, or C-A-R, or just the Republic, as it's known in this part of Africa. So with that out of the way, it is a landlocked country in Central Africa. It is bordered by, let's get pencil out, it's bordered by Chad, Sudan, South Sudan, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, the Republic of the Congo and Cameroon. And probably the biggest geographic feature of the Republic are its rivers. This map doesn't really show, it really only shows the major rivers, but this whole country is crisscrossed all over the place with tons of rivers. They all either flow up into Lake Chad or down into the Congo River, which can you see? You can kind of see the Congo River down here. The most important river would be the Bangi River, which makes up the southern border over here and flows into the Congo. And of course, the capital city is named after it. And as you can see here in the Republic, it's spelled like this, Ubangi. In the DRC, it's spelled like this. It's like French way, non French way, basically. And the country is very, like I said, it's very sparsely populated, but the densest part of this sparsely populated country would be in this section over here. It is very, very jungly, you know, in areas where we don't have cities and stuff. Um, just down here, if you remember my video on the DRC, it's home to the second largest rainforest in the world. So that overflows over here to Bangui and this area. Um, they do have their share of national parks and they're all very beautiful. They're full of like elephants and giraffes, like all the animals you think of when you think of like Africa or particularly Central Africa, like the rainforest jungly part of the continent. And, um, I think my favorite one out of the ones that I've checked out is down in this corner. It's called the Zonga Sanga National Park. It has buckets of elephants, which if you know me, that's my favorite animal. Um, but up here in the north, there are other parks as well. But um, in this area, like I said, very, very jungly, very thick. And the only real mountainy part of the country lies in this section over here. If you remember my video on Cameroon, Cameroon is incredibly mountainous and that overflows into this part of the Republic. The rest of the country, the further east you go, 
it gets uh, very flat. I mean, there are hilly parts, but compared to this, much flatter. Um, savanna grasslands for the most part, and like I said before, it's much more sparsely populated out here. And then once you get up here, if you remember my Chad video, it's pretty, you know, it's part of the Sahel zone, so it's much drier and um, not as green, you know, it has its lushness, what have you, but not nearly as much as down here. So in a nutshell, that is the basic geography of the Central African Republic. It doesn't look like a very large country compared to its neighbors, but I think I read it's about the size of France. So it's just, you know, maps, it's just surrounded by very, very large countries. So anyway, for its history, people first came to this area about 10,000 years ago, migrating down from the Sahara Sahel region as desertification spread. And my favorite fact, again, if you know me, you also know that I'm a huge nerd for stone circles. Um, some early person, people group, it's not entirely sure, about um, like 2300 BCE-ish, again, we'll never really know, built some megaliths around near what is now the city of Buar. And just like any kind of megalith stone circle place, it's all very mysterious, and there's only so much information we can gather from it. I think it's so awesome. It's apparently called the Stonehenge of Africa. Awesome. The people who lived here, there are lots of different ethnic groups that came and went throughout the centuries. They were primarily focused on farming and pretty much just living their lives until about the 16th to 17th centuries when other tribes in the area would come in here looking for slaves to sell. It was a huge target for slave raiders and that really upset, as you can imagine, the um, inner workings of all the different villages and tribes in the area. There were people who tried to rise up and go against it, but it was never anything significant. Um, the next major influence to come to the area would be the French. Um, like I've always mentioned, the scramble for Africa occurred in 1884, where different countries in Europe just drew lines on the map and picked out what parts of Africa they wanted. Uh, France, for the most part, took most of what is now the CAR. Um, they were more interested in this half of the country because it was very, very thick jungle and they didn't want to go too far, apparently. So they took over in 1894. They did cede some parts to Germany, but then World War I happened and that was a uh, like reverse Uno card and they just took it back. Um, and just like as it happens in a lot of other French controlled countries in Africa and even some British controlled countries in this part of Africa, um, this part, since it was under French influence, became more Christian. This part was more Muslim, so this part was more disregarded, um, which, as you can imagine later on, created some divisions, but just keep that uh, aside. And um, very interestingly, again, if you've seen my video on the Democratic Republic of the Congo, you learned about the Congo Free State, which was one of like the worst things to ever happen to any peoples in Africa. and. In the 1920s, France was like, let's just use that model, but without, like, the, the genocide and the, the secret police and all that, and use these Africans to exploit the land as much as possible. So the people in this region, like I said, in particular over here, you can see all the big cities, um, big cities, you know, compared to the rest of the world, they're not very big, but in this country they are the people were forced into really intense labor, such as cultivating cotton, um, harvesting rubber. The French built a railroad, which claimed a lot of lives. Um, disease spread as these people intermingled in their forced labor jobs. It, I mean, it wiped out nearly half the population of what is now the CAR, um, just like it did in the Congo Free State. And you know, it wasn't as vicious, but 
it was just the French thinking, let's just overwork these people. You know, they are commodities to us, basically. It was a really horrific time for these people. And there was a big uprising in 1928 known as the Congo War Rebellion. Um, it was all kept very hush-hush up in Europe because they didn't want people to know that these resources were being exploited in the way that they were. The French wound up crushing the rebellion in 1931. Flash forward to the end of World War II, and France decided to allow um, people from their areas in Africa, this part was known as the French Equatorial Africa, um, to allow elected officials to be represented in their national assembly. A man named Barthélemy Boganda was elected to the national assembly. He wound up turning against France and came back and was like, we want nothing to do with France. We're going to create our own rebel group and become our own political party and take over the government, which is precisely what they did. They won the political majority in 1957. France granted the country independence, but it was still considered part of France. In 1959, Boganda was actually killed in a plane crash, and um, his cousin David Daco decided to take over the government, and he declared full independence from France on August 13th, 1960. He was overthrown in a coup in 1965 by a man named Jean-Badel Bocasse, and Bocasse was quite a horrifying figure in that he named himself Emperor, changed the name to the Central African Empire, and spent pretty much all the money that the government had on lavish ceremonies and crowns and outfits and, you know, trying to live like a lavish emperor, which, of course, deeply affected everyone living in the country. The turning point of that part in its history came in 1979 when Emperor Bokassa declared that all the students had to wear uniforms that were created by a company owned by one of his wives. Polygamy is a thing in the Central African Republic to this day, so don't think too much into that. Um, but obviously, people were very upset by this. Uh, there was a big student protest, and at one of them, the like police fired on the crowds, killing about 100 teenagers and children, which, you know, kind of brought everything to a global attention. France helped to overthrow Bokassa and reinstall David Daco as president and reverse uno carded the empire back into a republic. Um, there was another coup in 1981. That president, you know, allowed elections but didn't allow his opponents to run. So after a lot of pro-democracy movements in the 1980s, uh, he allowed his opponents to run, and one of them was elected. His name was Ange Félix Patassé, and um, he was another figurehead that um, decided to not allow any other political parties to have any power. People were upset. He mysteriously won elections until he was overthrown in a coup in 2003 by a man named Francois Bozizé, and people were very, very upset about this. Like, like I said, you know, primarily Christian, primarily Muslim. This part was getting kind of fed up with all of the instability in the government. They didn't feel like they had a lot of say. A civil war broke out in 2002. Well, it was a Bush war, it's called. Um, and that was, as you can imagine, a very horrific time. This is a relaxation channel. We, we don't get into the dirty details about global horrors and things like that. So just, you can imagine an African civil war against rebel groups and corrupt leaders is never a good thing. A peace agreement was reached in 2007. Um, basically how most of these civil wars that break out in this part of the world, they allow the terrorists to form their own political parties and then no one votes for them when there's elections. Kind of how that settled. Uh, but after another election in 2011, when Bozizé won again, it became another huge movement against him. Uh, the big rebel group was called Seleka, and they sparked like a true civil war. They overthrew the capital, kicked Bozizé out, um, 
a splinter groups came up opposing that group, a splinter group of Seleka split off and formed their own group, all these groups fought, it was quite a mess. And there was an official peace agreement in 2014 that officially ended the civil war aspect, but these rebel groups still exist, some of them still hold parts of the country and control them. Um, it's, you know, and it's, it's hard because the country's trying to get on its feet in terms of democratic elections, and from what I can see in the past, uh, five to ten-ish years or so, they've been trying to do that, but it's hard when there are rebel groups with weapons, um, threatening people and controlling parts of the country, and... Um, you know, there's very low election turnout in that case, so the the president currently is very buddy-buddy with Putin, apparently, and has a personal Russian bodyguard, which is a big yikes, that's kind of a big red flag. Uh, but that is where the Central African Republic is today. It is one of the poorest countries in the world, one of the least developed countries in the world, um, that also means it has the least light pollution out of any country in the world, so there's that. Um, you know, researchers come to this country to study the stars, because you can see it pretty much clearly. Um, but it's kind of, you know, a bummer place to end the video, but that is where the country is today. And like I said, there isn't really much to show you on Google Earth. We all know what elephants and gorillas and giraffes look like, so I don't really want to show you too many pictures of that. There is some very beautiful waterfalls in this area near the capital, but we all kind of know what waterfalls look like also. So we're going to leave it there for tonight. Maybe sometime we can revisit this country and look at it a little deeper, I hope. I hope I can find some good material about it. But for now, that's the end. So thank you so much for watching. I really hope that you found this video relaxing and educational. And I hope that you have a very good, good good night. Good night.